Lighthouse Out Scientific Education presents a lecture in the Molecules in Compound series. The topic? Naming Compounds. This lecture is designed to be watched in parts. View the section that are currently relevant to the topic of your studies. Hold off viewing sections that have not been covered in your class. Material in this lecture relies on an understanding of the previous lectures bonding and overview, covalent bonding, and ionic bonding. It is important to note that these lectures expect the student to have a foundation in bonding type and the formation of bonds. Naming compounds from a formula is a necessary step in keeping order to the study of chemistry. This lecture looks at the naming structure of different types of compounds and is constructed to allow the students to view the lecture by topic. Our study begins with the naming of binary compounds. Binary compounds contain just two elements. One type of binary compound is the molecule. They contain two types of non-metal elements. Another type is the ionic bond, ionic compounds. There is some variation in the naming of ionic compounds. Those involving columns 1 and 2 cations and those with cations from the transition metal or heavy main group elements. In fact, there are two ways of naming these cations. And then there are polyatomic ions. These ions have their own proper names and, since they are involved in ionic bonding, will generally fall under the ionic bonding compound naming structure. Finally, there is acids and bases. First up is the naming of molecules and we will limit ourselves to binary compounds, which are composed of only two types of elements. They can have multiple atoms of each type. Binary compounds are not limited to two atoms, just two atom types or two elements. Molecules have molecular formulas. Listed here are a number of such formulas. Note that every element in every compound is a nonmetal. For the naming of molecules, there is a prep process and two steps. The prep process. It involves gathering all the components of the name before compiling the final name. Begin by writing the formula out, symbols and subscripts. Find the name for each element. Keep the order, that is keep the first element first and the second element second. And then there is a new concept. For each element, get its subscript and find the Greek prefix associated with that number. This is indeed a new factor. All textbooks will include a list of Greek terms for this purpose. What is really going on here is that the subscript for an element is being converted into a term that represents that number. For instance, a subscript 1 will be converted into the term mono. A 3 will be converted into the term tri. We are familiar with that prefix when used with the three-wheeled bike called the tricycle. Other familiar Greek prefixes include penta, as in the five-sided pentagon, and six and eight-sided shapes, hexagon and octagon, respectively. Once this is complete, we move into the two steps for compiling the final name. Step 1. Write the element name of the first atom in the formula. To that, add the Greek prefix based on the subscript value as determined in the prep process. Two things to note. Just to be clear, prefix means putting the term before the atom's name. Also, if the prefix of the first atom is a 1, we skip adding the term mono. The second step deals with the second element in the formula. It says to write out the stem of the element name. That usually involves lopping off the last syllable of the element name, but it can be a bit more complicated than that, and you require a bit of practice. The stem will need a term added to both its front and to its back to be completed. To the back of the stem, add the suffix ide, I-D-E. In front of the stem, add the Greek prefix determined in the prep process for this element. With that, the molecule has been named. 
A few examples are in order. In practice, the prep process can be incorporated into the two steps, and that is what we will do here. We will use the molecule CO2. The first step has us writing out the element name of the first atom in the formula, and that is carbon. Also, part of the first step is to add the appropriate Greek prefix as determined from the subscript on the carbon. Since there is no number, then we can imply that it is a 1, which the table tells us corresponds to the term mono. Another look at step 1 shows us that if the prefix for the first element is mono, we do not need to include it. We get to skip it. The first element is done. That was easy. Step 2, we need to get the element stem of the second element, and that is oxygen. But what is the stem for oxygen? It's just the first syllable, ox. From here, we add "-ide", to ox, forming oxide. And then the Greek prefix associated with the subscript 2. A look at the table shows that to be di. Add the di in front of the oxide and we have CO2 being called carbon dioxide. What if we were given the name carbon dioxide and wanted to get the molecular formula? The reverse of these steps works for getting the molecular formula, just given the name. The first element in the name is carbon. In the molecular formula, we will need to start with the element symbol C. An absence of a Greek prefix in front of the carbon means that it is a mono, and a 1 should be the subscript for the C. Of course, a 1 subscript is implied, not written. The second name tells us the second element is oxygen, and an O follows the C in the molecular formula. The prefix di is associated with the number 2, and that is put as a subscript to the O. Same steps. A second example is in order, and this one is B2Br4. Step 1 has us writing the element name of the first atom type, and that is B, and it stands for boron. We also need to find the appropriate Greek prefix. That is associated with the subscript 2. We just saw that that was di. Add di to the front of the word boron. On to the second atom type, and that is bromine. We only want its stem. To find its stem, we cut off the I-N-E. Replace it with I-D-E, giving bromide. Onto the prefix for bromide, what term is associated with the subscript for? That will be tetra. Add tetra to the front of bromide, giving the molecule diboron, tetrabromide. What should become apparent is that in naming these structures, the numerical information from the subscript is converted into text or written information. The IDE tells us the order of atoms in the molecular formula by indicating which is the second atom. While we're here, let's see if we can get the molecular formula from the name diboron tetrabromide. The first element in the name is boron. The molecular formula will need to start with the element symbol B. A Greek prefix of di in front of the boron means there are two borons in the molecular formula. The second name tells us the second element is bromine, and a Br follows the B in the molecular formula. The prefix tetra is associated with the number 4, and that is put as a subscript to the Br, giving the formula B2Br4. One more example, using this naming structure, and the molecule is CF. The first atom type is a familiar one. It is carbon. 
And noting that there is no subscript, we shop the number 1 and find the prefix mono. According to the first rule, we get to skip out writing mono for the first element. Moving to the second element, we also find a familiar element, and that is fluorine. Its stem is gotten by removing the INE, allowing us to add the ID suffix in generating the term fluoride. That's the chemical we find in our toothpaste. One more step, and that is to find the appropriate Greek prefix for fluoride. And again, noting an absence of a subscript, we'll be getting the prefix mono. Importantly, we need to recognize that for the second element, there is no provision for skipping the term mono. Therefore, CF is called carbon monofluoride. This compound is used in some types of lithium batteries. Our next naming structure is one of several structures involving ionic compounds. It handles compounds in which cations are an element from columns 1 or column 2 on the periodic table. An inspection of the table will show us the elements found in these ionic compounds. On the upper right side, we find the nonmetals, which will form the anions in the binary ionic compound. On the left side of the table are the metals in column 1 and 2. These metal elements form the cations in the compound. As for the steps to name these compounds, given a formula unit, step 1, write the metal element's name. That, of course, is the cation. Step 2, write the stem of the non-metal element's name. These are the same stems that we saw in the naming of binary molecules. To that stem, add ide, I-D-E. Should we add a Greek prefix? No. The number of each type is implied by balancing the charges. In the ionic bonding lecture, we showed how the formula unit was derived from the numerical values of the subscripts. We balanced the total positive and negative charges. If the student is still uncomfortable moving into the formula unit from the ion type or moving to ion type from formula unit, return to the ionic bonding lecture and review. Table salt, NaCl, is a good first example of this naming structure. Step 1 has us finding the metal element's name. Na is sodium. The second step begins with finding the stem of the non-metal element. Starting with chlorine, the stem of chlorine is chlor. And to that stem, we add an ide, giving the anion chloride. NaCl is sodium chloride. A second example uses MgBr2. We begin with the naming of the metal ion, which is magnesium. We then find the stem name of the nonmetal element, which is bromine. Earlier we saw that the stem of bromine is brome. To complete the process, we add ide to the stem, bromide and MgBr2 is referred to as magnesium bromide. Our final example in this naming structure uses CaO. Step 1 is getting the name of the metal element, Ca, which is a symbol for calcium. Next we want the stem of the nonmetal, which is oxygen. Earlier we saw the stem of oxygen is ox. To that, add ide, giving oxide, calcium oxide. There's a lot of similarity between naming the anion in these compounds and naming the second element in a molecule. They both use the stem of the element name and add ide. The only difference is that in the molecule we add a Greek prefix. Making such connections between naming structures helps reduce the overall complexity of naming compounds. Our next structure, under the binary compound heading, also involves ionic compounds. But the cations here come mostly from transition metals. 
Returning to the periodic table, we again find our anions coming from the nonmetals, but the cations are coming from the transition metals and, to a limited degree, some of the heavier main group elements, like lead at atomic number 82. At this level of chemistry, the most common transition metal cations are with these row 3 elements, chromium to zinc. In this lecture, when the term transition metal is used in the context of a naming structure, it will also include these heavier main group elements. Unlike columns 1 and 2 metal ions, the charge on transition metals is not so obvious. Fortunately, students are generally not asked to predict them, at least most students. They may be asked to deduce them, like determining that Fe, iron, has a plus 2 charge in FeCl2. Making matters more complicated is that some transition metals have more than one type of cation. They are called multivalent. There are several examples of multivalent elements on the table, including chromium and iron. Another way these metal ions differ from column 1 and 2 metal ions is that there are two ways to name the transition metal cations, and they reflect the ion's charge. The first structure is referred to as the systematic name. It is a combination of the element's name and the charge on the ion written in Roman numerals. The Roman numerals are included in parentheses behind the element's name. When speaking the name, say the element name and then the number. Like cobalt 3 or nickel 2. The other naming structure is referred to as the common name. It starts with the Latin root of the element's name. From there, there is a suffix added based on the distinction between the different charges that the multivalent ion can take. We can loosely describe the options as adding OUS to the root if the cation is the lower charge option, or adding the ending IC if the cation is the higher charge option. No doubt a confusing naming structure. Examples should help, and we will return to the multivalent cations chromium and iron. Consider the chromium. Its Latin root is chrome. It readily forms a plus 2 or a plus 3 cation. According to the common naming structure, the lower plus 2 charge will end in the O-U-S, chromus. The higher plus 3 charge will end in I-C, chromic. As for iron, its Latin root is fer, F-E-R-R. -R. It also readily forms a plus 2 or a plus 3 cation. According to the naming structure, the lower charge plus 2 cation will end in us, fair us. The higher charge plus 3 will end in ick, fair ick. With any luck, your instructor will only ask you to learn the systematic naming structure. We will, however, practice both. Using what we have seen on this table, the naming of ionic compounds involving transition metal and heavier main group cations involves a prep stage, and two steps. As a prep, we need to determine the charge on the ions. In the ionic bonding lecture, we saw that the ionic compounds are neutral, and the total amount of negative charge equals the total amount of positive charge. These charges are found by multiplying an ion's charge by its subscript as found in the formula unit. More on this momentarily. Once the charge are determined, proceed to step one. Write the metal ion name using the appropriate naming structure. This step assumes that the student knows whether the cation is to be named using the systematic or common name structure. Step two is the same as it was in the naming structure for ionic compounds with columns one or two cations. That is, write the stem of the non-metal element's name and then add "-ied". We will practice by naming two different iron-containing compounds. We will begin by getting the cation charge for each compound before naming the compounds using both the systematic 
and common naming structures. While examples of getting cation charge are given here, the process is covered more in depth in the ionic bonding lecture. The charge on an anion is usually known or relatively easy to find, so we will demonstrate the prep process by getting the charge on the iron in FeCl2. Iron cations can come in more than one size charge, so we will need to determine what the charge is on the iron cation. The first order of business is to get the total negative charge, and that is found by multiplying the subscript on the Cl by the charge on the Cl. Inspection of the formula unit has Cl with a subscript of 2, and a look at the periodic table has chlorine forming a minus 1 anion. Multiplying the minus 1 charge by the 2 from the subscript gives a total negative charge of negative 2. This must be matched in size by the charge on the cation times its subscript. There is no subscript for the iron, so by default the subscript must be 1. The calculation for the total positive charge is therefore the unknown charge times the implied 1 from the subscript. What value times 1 equals a positive 2? Yes, the charge has to be a plus 2. Now we know that the iron is a plus 2 cation. What about the iron in Fe2O3? Same process is used to get the total negative charge. Note that the subscript on oxygen is 3, and recognizing that when oxygen gains 2 electrons, it fills its outer shell and adopts a minus 2 charge. The total negative charge due to the anion is therefore a minus 2 charge times 3 subscript for a value of minus 6. The total positive charge will need to be a plus 6. Using the 2 from the subscript, try to figure out what the charge needs to be on the iron such that its charge times 2 is equal to plus 6. That will of course be a plus 3. In this compound, iron is a plus 3 cation. Now that charge has been established, it is time to name these two compounds. Returning to the first compound, FeCl2, iron is a plus 2 cation in this compound. The first step is to get the name of the metal ion. We will do this using the systematic naming structure first. That's the easier one because all we need to do is write the element's name, iron, and put the charge as Roman numerals in parentheses. 2. Iron 2. Remember that while the charge is written in Roman numerals, we actually use the word 2 when we speak the name out loud. The second step is to get the stem of the non-metal element. The element is chlorine, and its root is chlor. To this we add ide, chloride. FeCl2 is called iron 2 chloride. What about its name using the common name structure? Well, the chloride will remain unchanged, and we will have to go to the table of cation names and find iron plus 2. The common name for iron 2 is ferrous. The us ending tells us that the iron cation is the lower charge option. FeCl2 is also known as ferrous chloride. And then there is the high charge option for iron that has a plus 3 cation, Fe2O3. First we find the metal name using the systematic name, that is the element name followed by the charge in Roman numeral 3. Next we get the stem of the nonmetal, which is oxygen. Its stem is just ox, to which we add ide to give oxide. Fe2O3 is iron 3 oxide. For the common name structure, the nonmetal ion is still oxide. 
returning to the list of cation names and finding iron with a plus three charge, iron three is also known as ferric. We see the ic ending with the higher charge cation. Fe2O3 is also known as ferric oxide. Overall, the naming structure involving transition metals is relatively similar to the structure involving column 1 and 2 cations. True, the common name structure involves new and perhaps foreign terms, but chemistry is an ancient science and is therefore going to have some ancient terminology. This is also the case for polyatomic ions. Polyatomic ions are covered in more detail in both the ionic bonding and the covalent bonding lectures. Some covalent molecules have a net charge, and that makes them ions. Simply put, the number of protons does not equal the number of electrons. Students are generally not asked to memorize the table of polyatomic ions. Rather, names are memorized based on repeated exposure. By this time in their study, students should have seen the ions ammonium, NH4+, nitrate, NO3-, hydroxide, OH-, and sulfate, SO4-2. For polyatomic ions, the single most confusing issue that many students have is that some elements form polyatomic ions with different number of bound oxygens. For example, sulfur, as a central atom, can form polyatomic ions with three oxygens or with four oxygens. To distinguish the difference, for such elements, polyatomic ion names end in ite with the ion that has less oxygens bound to the central atom and eight with the ion that has more oxygens bound to the central atom. A similar type of distinction was made in the common name structure for transition metal ions, except it was between more and less charge. Look at the element phosphorus. It can form a polyatomic ion with three oxygens. It can also form an ion with four oxygens. The three bond oxygen is the ion with the less oxygens. Therefore, PO3 minus three ends in ite, phosphite. The four bond oxygen is the ion with the more oxygens. PO4 minus three ends in eight, phosphate. The minus three charge does not come into play in the naming structure. Nitrogen can form a polyatomic ion with two oxygens and with three oxygens. Two is less, ite. Three is more, eight. NO2 minus is nitrite. NO3 minus is nitrate. The same argument can be made with sulfate and sulfite. For most students, this is as far as they need to go in understanding the way polyatomic ions are named. Eight is more, eight is less. For some students though, they will be asked to recognize a broader collection of polyatomic ion names. For some elements, there is actually a range of terms for the abundance of bound oxygens. Some elements make more than two different types of polyatomic ions with oxygen. The more or less oxygen is not sufficient to distinguish between them all. Here's a naming structure table with four possible combinations of oxygens added to an element. It starts at the bottom with a minimum or least number of bound oxygens to a specific element and moves up to the most number of bound oxygens. The more or less oxygen designation of ite and eight are still there, but distinguish between middle values. Note that the ite suffix is used with the lower two quantities of oxygens and the eight suffix with the two higher quantities. To distinguish between the number of bound oxygen of the two higher quantities, a prefix of per or PER is added to the one with the most oxygens. To distinguish between the bound oxygens with the lower quantities, a prefix of hypo or HYPO is added to the one with the least oxygens. It is probably best to attach some real names to this structure. Our polyatomic ion table 
has an example of an element, chlorine, capable of forming ions with one to four oxygens. Chlor is the root. We can see the name of the chlorine bound to one oxygen. It has the hypo prefix and the ite suffix. Hypochlorite, ClO minus one. If chlorine is bound to two oxygens, it will not include the hypo and will be just called chlorite. When bound to three oxygen, it is called chlorate, and when bound to four oxygen, it adds the prefix per and becomes perchlorate. Generally, students need only to recognize that such a structure exists with the ite and eight suffix designating the lower and higher amounts of oxygen, respectively. So far, we have talked about the naming of individual polyatomic ions but polyatomic ions do form ionic compounds. And the naming of such compounds follows the set rules for ionic compounds, except the polyatomic ion name is inserted unchanged. Returning to the general steps for naming ionic compounds, we modify the steps to include a polyatomic ion. If the anion or cation is not a polyatomic ion, the steps are unchanged. If the cation is a polyatomic ion, then step one is rewritten to include the option of having and naming a polyatomic ion. If the anion is a polyatomic ion, then step two will not be looking for its stem, and it will not add an ide. Step two will simply involve putting in the polyatomic ion name. All right, let's name the compound NaNO3. The first step is to write the metal ion name, using the appropriate naming structure. Na is a column 1 element, so we will add the element name sodium. Step 2 has us add the polyatomic ion name unaltered. Referring to the table, we see NO3 is the nitrate ion. Add the name, and we're done. NaO3 is sodium nitrate. The second example combines the transition metal naming structure with that for the polyatomic ion. It is as involved as naming gets at this level and demonstrates many of the processes that are needed to become competent at naming compounds. The compound is PbSO42. We name the metal ion first and we're going to use the systematic naming structure. That means name of element followed by charge written in Roman numeral. But what is the charge on PB? Well, it looks like we're going to have to determine the charge, which means we're going to have to balance the total positive and total negative charge. For the total positive charge, it's going to be the currently unknown value of the charge times the subscript on the PB. Since there is not a written subscript for PB, it is assumed to be a 1. The total negative charge will be the charge on the polyatomic ion, which we may not know, times its subscript in the formula unit, which we see is a 2. We have seen SO4 a number of times, and we may have memorized its charge, or we can look it up. SO4 is the sulfate ion. Let's write that down for future use. And it has a charge of minus 2. The total negative charge is therefore minus 4. Back to the charge on the PB. What value must the charge be such that when multiplied by the subscript value of 1 he has a total positive charge with a magnitude of 4? Right, a plus 4. And this compound PB is a plus 4 ion. We are ready to name the cation. Perhaps you already know that PB is lead. If not, look up PB on the periodic table. The systematic name for lead ion with a plus 4 charge is lead 4. Step 2 has us using the polyatomic anion name as is. Fortunately, we wrote that down. It's sulfate, and our compound is lead 4 sulfate. 
What if we want to use the common name structure? Well, the sulfate isn't going to change, but we will need to look up the lead ion. Lead 4 is called plumbic. The root for lead is P-L-U-M-B, like it is for the word plumbing. In fact, the word plumbing comes from the Romans who used lead pipes to bring water to their cities. Lead 4 sulfate can be called plumbic sulfate. The final naming topic of our lecture is that for acids and bases. And we will limit our discussion to acids and bases defined as acid, a compound that can release a proton or hydrogen ion, H+, and a base, a compound that can donate a hydroxide ion, OH-. Hydroxide is a polyatomic ion. First to naming bases. Bases use the steps for naming ionic compounds. That also includes the modification for polyatomic anions, like hydroxide. Since we've already covered this type of naming structure, in the lecture, we will not practice naming bases here. For acids, there are actually two different naming structures. The first is for binary compounds. These contain two elements, a metal, always hydrogen, and a nonmetal. The second type of acid has a polyatomic anion. These anions often contain oxygens and are categorized as oxyacids. We will look at each naming structure in turn, starting with the binary acids. The first step is to get the name for the element hydrogen, and that is just its root or stem, hydro. The second step has us write out the stem of the non-hydrogen element. This is similar to the step for getting the stem of the anion in the ionic compound naming structure. In that naming structure, an ide was added to the stem. In this structure, it is an ic. Step three is to add the term acid to the end of the name. Let's try it out with HCl. Step one has us writing out the root of hydrogen, hydro. Step two begins by getting the stem from the non-hydrogen element. It's chlorine, which has a stem of chlor. To that, we add an ick. And finally, to the end of the name, we add the term acid. HCl is hydrochloric acid. A second example is HI. Step one, name the hydrogen as hydro. Step two, get the stem of the element name. Iodine, it loses the ine. To the stem, we add the suffix ic. And finally, to the end of the name, we add the term acid. HI is hydroiodic acid. These binary acids have straightforward names. Now, to the oxyacids, polyatomic anions containing oxygen. They are more difficult to name because the student has to be familiar with the naming of polyatomic ions. In the section of this lecture in which we covered the polyatomic naming structure, it was noted that some elements form polyatomic ions with different number of bound oxygens. To distinguish between the abundance of oxygens, the name of the polyatomic ion ends in ite for the anion that has less bound oxygens or ate for the ion that has more bound oxygens. That can be seen with the three oxygens attached to the nitrogen in nitrate and the two oxygens attached to the nitrogen in nitrite. As for steps in naming oxyacids, first get the root name of the polyatomic anion. Just take off the ite or eight. There are two exceptions to just lopping off the last three letters, and they occur when the F sound precedes the ite or eight. That is the case with sulfite and sulfate. The sulf root becomes sulfur. Yes, it retains the entire element name. Some textbooks use a spelling where the F is replaced with the PH. A similar case occurs with the 
phosphite and phosphate. The root in naming the acid is phosphor. Back to our steps. If the polyatomic ion has a prefix hypo or per, keep that. To the root name, add an os if ite was taken off. Add an ic if eight was taken off. Finally, tag the term acid to the end. In essence, this acid naming structure just switches out the last syllable in the polyatomic anion name. Os for ite or ic for eight. Add the term acid and you're done. So what is the name of the acid HNO3? Start by finding the name of the polyatomic anion and remove its ending. Referring to our table, we see that the NO3 is the nitrate ion. In due time, we will be removing that 8. Does the nitrate have a prefix? No, we can skip that step. What should we add once we remove the 8? Right, an ick. All that is left is to add the term acid. HNO3 is nitric acid. And then there is the acid H3PO4. It has a polyatomic anion. To name it, we need to find its polyatomic name. It's common enough that some students will remember that it is called phosphate. It has a minus 3 charge. If we remove the 8, we have phosph, which ends in an F sound. So this is one of those roots that get modified. The correct root is phosphor. It doesn't have a prefix, so we're not going to bother with this part. We remove an 8, so we're going to add an ick. All that is left is to add the term acid. H3PO4 is phosphoric acid. One last example, and it is the acid HClO. We need to get the root of the polyatomic ion ClO-. That turns out to be hypochlorite. We need to remove the ite, and we have our root. The next part of step one says to keep the hypo. The reason this part is included is that some students may be tempted to just keep the chlor because it is the root of chlorine. The hypo stays because chlorine is bound to the least amount of oxygens, one. And since we removed ite, we add us. Tag on an acid and we're done. HClO is hypochlorous acid. Recapping the lecture. Naming binary molecules. Step 1. Write the element name of the first atom in the formula. Unless its subscript is a 1, mono, add the appropriate Greek prefix to the element name. The second step is to write the stem of the element name of the second atom. Add ide to the stem and add its appropriate Greek prefix, including mono. For ionic compounds with column 1 or 2 cations, begin by writing the metal element's name, then write the stem of the non-metal element's name and add ide to the stem. For ionic compounds with cations that are transition metals or heavy main group elements, there is a prep process which the student determines the charge on the metal ion before going into step one. Write the metal ion's name using the appropriate naming system, systematic or common names. Step two, write the stem of the non-metal element's name and add ide to the stem. Polyatomic ions containing oxygens have themselves a naming structure based on the abundance of oxygens. They end in ite for the ion with the less bound oxygen or 
and in 8 for the ion with more bound oxygen. As for naming them in compounds, step 1 is to write the name of the polyatomic ion or metal ion using the appropriate naming structure as outlined for other ionic compounds. Step 2 is the anion name. If the anion is a polyatomic ion, write its name unchanged. If not, revert back to the anion naming structure as outlined in the other ionic compound naming structures. We also looked at the naming of acids and bases. For bases, use the rules for naming ionic compound with polyatomic ions. There are two naming structures for acids. The first is for binary acids. Step 1, write the prefix hydro for hydrogen. Step 2 is to write the stem of the element name of the second atom to which is added an IC. Finally, add the term acid to the end. The second naming structure is for oxy acids. Here we begin by writing out the root name of the polyatomic ion. For most polyatomic ions, it means dropping the it or eight. If the name has a hypo or per, keep it. Depending on the ending dropped from the polyatomic name, add us if it was a it or add ick if it was a eight. And then add the term acid. And that concludes a very busy lecture. With so many procedures to remember, the student really needs to practice, review, and to look for patterns between the different naming structures.